Again, it is me. I hope you're not tired to see me and hear me speak. Uh, well, shall we do that again? I hope you are not tired to hear me speak. <laughs> well, friend, <laughs> good, good. Uh, well, we start a new sermon series. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, this was the right Sunday to come to church uh, because we can journey together uh, on this uh, I'm really excited about, about this new Sermon series. I've been enjoying reading, researching, and preparing for this Sermon series. I'm, enti I'm entitling this Sermon series, Stories of Faith, When God Uses Ordinary People in Extraordinary Ways. Stories of Faith, When God Uses Ordinary People in Extraordinary Ways. And this Sermon is based on one of the most famous chapters in the Bible. Uh, this is in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. So if you have a hard copy of your Bible, just go to the middle and turn right. You'll be in the New Testament and flip a few pages. You'll probably end up in Hebrews. And so chapter 11, there's a whole list of people who were ordinary men and women, imperfect, broken, flawed, everyday people, but for whom God used for their own good and for his glory. Uh, now, because these people are imperfect, I will not be telling you and I that you need to be like them. I'll not be telling you you need to be a Noah or you need to be an Abraham. Uh, for the ladies, I'll not be asking you to be a Sarah. I mean, who wants to conceive at age 90? Any hands? Any hands? <laughs> None. Okay, good. But what we are going to do, we are going to learn from certain aspects of their lives, both the good, the bad, and the ugly. These are real people who are going through real issues but engage with a real God. There's a total of uh, 16 people mentioned here. We'll not go through all of them, uh, like one every Sunday, but we'll combine a few of them. I encourage you to read ahead, uh, not only the chapters, but also the stories in the Old Testament. Now, uh, if you received a copy of the newsletter, uh, on page two, uh, there is that same chart that you have on your slide. It is there in your newsletter. So please keep that newsletter uh, for future reference. If you'd like to read their stories, I have written where their stories are found in the Old Testament. So, uh, please uh, read ahead and engage in these stories because they are very inspiring, they are encouraging, and I know that everyone here will learn something and be inspired and encouraged by these stories. In the stories, you will see how they, these people, these men and women, these everyday, ordinary people put their trust and confidence in God. You will see how they took God at his word and in obedience put into action some of God's crazy ideas. And God in turn blessed them. You will see how they persevered through trials and, and tribulations and testings and difficulties and distresses and still exercised their trust and confidence in God. These stories will make you smile. These stories will make you cry. But I believe that each one of these stories will inspire and encourage each one of you. Most of all, these stories point to something better and perfect. While God uses these men and women in their brokenness, their stories were a foreshadow, a pointer to something and someone better and superior, and that is the Savior, Jesus Christ. All these stories are found in the Old Testament, but all their stories are pointing to something that is more perfect, something better, something superior, and something superlative, and that is Jesus Christ. So, may these stories in a unique way reveal and point us to Christ. May these stories increase our trust and confidence in God. May these stories make our faith if you're a follower of Christ, may these stories make our faith come alive and active. 
I don't know about you, but I long and desire to experience God in a real way. Is, is that your longing or desire? If it is, there is some good stuff in the stories. If it is not, I, I hope that I will whet your appetite enough to want to experience and encounter God in such a real way. As a church funnel and as a, 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 as a dial, we are, are in the season of discernment. And I pray that these stories open our spiritual eyes to see God who he has been at work and is currently at work to implement his purposes. Some that may never live to see these purposes, as we will see about these people. Here's the interesting thing about life and about these stories, is that men and women were born, they lived, some were successful for a period of time, and they died. And other men and women were born, they lived, some were successful, some were not, then they died. Then other men were born, they lived, some were successful, some <coughs> were not, but they died. But the most consistent thing is God. As all these men lived and died, God is a constant. Some people have called this chapter a chapter of people of heroes of faith, but as we will see, that they are nowhere close to being heroes, but God is a hero. And some of these men and women were given promises and trusted God for certain things. They never lived to see these promises come to fruition, but those promises still came to fruition according to God's purposes. In fact, let me start with the end in mind and the reason why we are doing this. Let me read uh, Hebrews chapter 11, right at the end of this chapter, and then uh, chapter 12 and verse 1 to 2. It kind of gives us the reason why we have this list and their stories. So, verse 39 of chapter 11. All these people, that we will, the 17, and it's actually a list of at least 17 named people, all these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Uh, faith uh, defined as trust and confidence in God. Yet none of them received all that God had promised. God did promise some things. Some of them uh, saw these things come to fruition, but some of them, and most of them, did not see this come to fruition, though those things uh, came to fruition. Verse 40, For God had something better in mind for us, so that, we, uh, so that they would not reach perfection without us. Therefore, since we are surrounded with such a great cloud of witnesses, therefore, since we are surrounded by these witnesses of people, let us throw off everything that hinders and, that this, and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. I believe in a God who has, uh, has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. And, and he invites us to experience his purpose and purpose through him. And so he's calling us to fix our eyes on him. And as we are running this life race, that we persevere through everything. But so that we may run the race appropriately, we need to get rid of those things that easily hinder us and the sin that easily entangles us. Here's my point. The men and women lived not for themselves, but for what God had in store for the future and for his glory. My hope and prayer is that on the basis of God's promises, God's word, and the example of this men and women, we will throw off everything that hinders us from experiencing God in a deep personal level. And my prayer is that we will deal with the sin that so easily entangles, that hinders us from experiencing God. And that together we will fix our eyes on Jesus. We will at a personal level and as a church final, we will not fear but be courageous and take steps of faith for our good and for God's glory. Amen? Amen. So, today I'm just going to deal with three verses. That's verse 1, 2, and 3 of Hebrews 
chapter 11, just to give us a foundation, um, and then we'll pick up the story from next week. So let us read together verse 1 and 2 of Hebrews 11. It's on the screen. In 3, 2, 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Now, this verse is famous because it defines uh, what faith is. It gives us an idea on the sub substance of faith. But before I talk a little bit more about what faith is as per the author of Hebrew, I want you to know that there are three types of faith that the Bible talks about. One of, the, of this kind, and they're different, one of it is what we call saving faith. And we need to understand this, saving faith. This is according to uh, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, it's a gift of God. It's not, uh, uh, not by works so that no one can boast. So everyone... Each one of us who is a follower of Christ, who has a relationship with Christ Jesus, we have, had this, we have this relationship with Christ through this saving faith. And this is the end, you could call it the entry point to this relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus Christ uh, came to be the bridge between humanity and God the Father. And he invites us to a relationship with God the Father by believing in who he is, that he was born, he lived and walked the dusty streets of Jerusalem, he did the miracles that are recorded in the Bible, he died and rose again, and there is evidence for that, and he claimed that he's coming back, and yes, he is. If you believe that, then you come, you believe in him through what we call saving faith. And at that point, let me pause and say, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I recommend to you Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That you may experience this saving faith. But the other kind of faith is what you call the gift of faith. Having been uh, uh, saved by faith through grace, now the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you and you have what you call spiritual gifts. And one of the spiritual gifts is the gift of faith. And you see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where there are about nine spiritual gifts that are listed. And one of them is the gift of faith. So what are spiritual gifts? I'm glad that you asked. Okay? So spiritual gifts are gifts given by God, by, uh, the Holy Spirit, to anyone who by faith has believed in Jesus Christ and actively following him. So you believe Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in you, and he uh, indwells in you, and he gives you, um, he gives you uh, uh, spiritual gifts. Now, remember they are gifts. You, you do not choose what kind of gift that you will get. It is God who sovereignly, by his will and his good will, he chooses what gift he's going to Give who? And so that is, uh, and this spirit, the, the spiritual gifts uh, uh, are to encourage the, for the encouragement of the body of Christ and to further the kingdom of God. As one commentator writes and says about gift, uh, g uh, gift of faith, the Holy Spirit provides some Christians with extraordinary confidence in God's promises, power, and presence, so that they can make heroic stands for the future of God's work in the church. The spiritual gift of faith is, is exhibited by one with a strong and unshakable confidence in God, his word, and his promises. It is the ability to trust God with a confidence in the midst of some kind of difficulty. Do, do you know of people or Christians who have the gift of faith? The world could be exploding around them, but they are measured, they are calm, they are at peace, and they have this confidence in God. Have you met those kind of people? They probably have the gift of faith. And it's a wonderful thing. So we've talked about the saving faith, the gift of faith, 
And then the third one, which the book of Hebrews chapter 11 is talking about, is what we call living faith. This is the faith that, uh, that, that the author of Hebrews is referring to. So having been saved, God wants every believer to exercise faith or trust and have confidence in God, his word, as part of our daily life. So back to the text. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients or the elders were commended for, or all these uh, people were commended for. Let's take a chill pill there. While the Bible says all these things about faith and defines and describes faith in this way, in our modern Western thinking, Christian faith is commonly regarded at best groundless optimism and at worst as ignorant, irrational, and dangerous fantasy. Secular atheists, Christopher Hitchens, author of the book, God is not great, why religion poisons everything, he says, faith is a surrender of the mind, it's the surrender of reason, it's the surrender of the only thing that makes us different from other mammals. And probably you have heard this, from Christopher Hitchens or other atheists or versions of it from other people. Indeed, it is common for Christians to be regarded as unscientific, anti-intellectual, though in truth, when people become Christians, they characteristically think and read more than ever before. This kind of thinking is a misconception that has shaped our society. This kind of thinking has also shaped us as Christians. We have heard this message from the society so many times we have probably drunk the Kool-Aid, we have come to believe it. That faith at best is groundless optimism. And probably someone has ever told you as a, as a Christian, why would you want to trust and have confidence in, in God? D does God even exist? Well, Hebrews 11 will powerfully refute this misconception of Christi about Christian faith by the society. It's something like this. Um, the minister today came with a knife. And you're probably wondering... Why would a minister come with a butter knife? You see, here's what's happening in our society. It's like this knife being put in this jar of water. Once you put the knife in, it looks as though it is bent or broken. Can you see? But it is not bent or broken. And neither do I do magic. But what is happening is that light has gone through the water and there is refraction. And so it creates this idea or it creates this idea that the knife, which is straight, is bent or broken. This is what is happening in our society. We live in a society that has told us that Christian faith is bent, broken, refracted, and distracted. That we cannot believe this faith. And we live in this saturated society that says, why would you want to believe God and have faith in him? Why would you want to put trust and confidence in him? But really what is happening is that we live in a society that's already broken and makes us think that everything else, especially our faith in God and Christianity itself, is not real. But it is real. And we come to church with this mindset. Actually, if you look at our society and New Zealand culture closely, it will make you think that faith is of no use. It is distorted view of this world 
and society. And some of us have been shaped and formed by this idea. It explains, maybe it explains why as followers of Christ, we really don't have a vibrant trust and confidence in God. Uh, probably this explains why less and less people want to consider God. Because our society is distracted. But as we will see in this chapter, as we look at these real people with real issues meeting a real God, we will realize that faith is real and you and I can put our trust and confidence in God. Our Christian faith is relational trust and confidence in God based upon relational evidence of his truthful reliability. Christian faith is not irrational fantasy or sentimental optimism. It is the confidence in the truth revealed by God in his personal word, Jesus Christ, as he is revealed in his written word, the Bible. Being true, the Bible is consistent with natural truth discovered by scientists. So while Christian faith is certainly more than scientific, it is not less than scientific. Christian faith is real and tangible. I love how the Amplified Bible breaks this verse down. Now, faith is the assurance. And actually, what the, the, the original word gives this two cents. It is like a title deed. This assurance is like a title deed. When you have a title deed for a property, it is as good as owning the property. It is proof, legal proof, that you own that property. So that, that is what faith is. Here is real evidence. Here is real proof. Faith is like a title deed. And it is divinely guaranteed. Now, faith is the assurance, title deed, confirmation of things hoped for. This is not just wishful thinking. This is guaranteed. But faith also is the evidence of things not seen. We live in a world that says that seeing is believing, but faith is actually believing as you see through your spiritual eyes. Believing this God who has said in the character of God and his promises in his word. It is the evidence of things not seen, that is, the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. And with this definition of faith, there is no better place to start all this, uh, these stories than in verse 3. Then I'll just talk about it and I'll wrap it up. Verse 3, it says, By faith, by this assurance, by this title deed, by this confirmation that is divinely guaranteed, by faith, we understand the entire universe was formed at God's command that we now see did not come from anything that cannot be seen. The starting point to this story is if you are going to believe the accounts of Noah, of Abraham, of Sarah, of all those people that have been named, if you are actually going to believe those stories, the starting point is believing that God actually created the universe. Of course, people have said, well, there's Big Bang, why should we consider God the creator? And of course, moved a little bit further and said, probably God does not exist, God is dead. But if we are going to believe in God, we better believe that he is the one who created the universe. Whether you believe that he created in the literal six days or uh, 6,000 years, because Second Peter 3.18 says that a day is like, a, a thousand years is like a day for God. Okay, however you believe and how you're convinced. But the point is that if we believe that God created the universe, then, then, you will be able to believe him when anything comes your way. Whenever you have any trouble or anything that comes your way, you will be able to believe this God who is a creator. Now, let me just back up a little bit and say that there are two Hebrew words that are used to uh, define um, creation. The first one is bara. 
Bara means uh, creating out of nothing. Lat the Latin for that is ex nihilo. And the other word is asa, to make something with material that has already been created. The author of Hebrews, of this particular book, uses bara, to create out of nothing. He's saying that God has created the universe out of nothing. Ex nihilo. And if we are to believe this God who has created from nothing, then nothing is impossible with him. Brother, sister, if you ever go through any difficulty or trial, you can believe this God who has the power to create anything out of nothing. If, if you are, have a struggle, you can believe this God who not only has a power, but is also present and personal in people's life, as we will see in the lives of these 16 men and women. The Lord is powerful enough to deal with your issue, would you trust and have confidence in him? Whatever issue it may be. Maybe it is a broken relationship, a strained marriage relationship, strained relationship with your parents, or a strained relationship with your kids and your grandkids, or probably you have lost your property, whatever issue it may be, or something, an addiction that you are dealing with. This God who created the universe from nothing, he is powerful enough to deal with your issue. And he is personal enough to come close to you, compassionate enough to be there with a the broken hearted. He is here with you. Would you trust him and put your confidence in him? It reminds me of Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 17. In closing it says, this is one of my favorite verses. O sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth. By your great power and outstretched arm, nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is too difficult for God because God created everything. He's a creator of the universe. He can handle every situation. So let's say this uh, verse together. Let's, let's recite it together as we finish. One, two, three. O oh, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. God bless and have a great week. Amen.